guys. Hi, right, welcome. I'd like to introduce uh, the panel. That's me. I'm the CFO of Zerto. I'm here for, been here for three years. Um, before that, I was at a company that was acquired by Intel, and then we had another acquisition through TCS. Uh, when I started Zerto, just to give you the magnitude, I think we were about 110, 120 employees. Now we're just shy of 600. Uh, continue to grow, so enjoying the growth and enjoying the partnership that we have with these guys. Um, would you guys introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm Nick Scola. I'm currently a senior engineer for virtualization at Viacom. Uh, for those who don't know what Viacom is, it's basically MTV, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, Paramount Pictures. So we're you know major player in the uh, media industry. Um, I've been a Zerto customer myself for about three years now. I've used it uh, in the past in the financial <coughs> industry, um, a couple hedge funds, and uh, you know, love the product, love what it does, and it's helped me out tremendously. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Monroy. Uh, I work for Cushman and Wakefield, and I wear uh, several different hats. Two of the main hats that I wear is uh, head of application hosting globally, as well as Active Directory, um, in charge of any like the innovation type projects related to those those areas. Um, been with the company about four years. Uh, we're a company, I don't know if you guys know what the company does, but I'll just do a brief uh, overview. Uh, real estate services, so they kind of do real estate brokerage, you know, sell real estate space to large firms um, or lease it out to large firms. And then we also do facilities management where we take care of buildings, uh, janitorial services, etc. Great. Um, some general question. I'd like to know any unique challenges that you have in your IT, in your industry. And is there anything in particular that you can define as mission critical and how do you deal with those? So for us, um, ad sales is a, a tremendous amount of our, our revenue. So, you know, basically selling ad space and to, uh, you know, anyone who wants to basically buy uh, time on, you know, our networks. So the applications that serve those sales are tremendously important to our environment. So basically, you know, we, we could be talking a million dollars an hour um, in sales. So we have to make sure that those are protected basically to as close to real time as we could possibly get. And um, not only are they protected, but the time that it takes for us to recover them in the event of an outage, you know, has to be, um, you know, minimal. Uh, they've tried using, you know, old style, like, you know, storage replication and database mirroring, that sort of thing. And for us, it just wasn't good enough. So we had to move to something that was a little bit easier to manage. And, um, gave us the flexibility for closer to real time, um, but the recoverability was more important because we had to get that up and running so they can continue making sales. So, you know, obviously that's where we went to Zerto. And when you were planning between mission critical, non-mission critical, do you have any different plans for different types of application or it's for as far as you're concerned is? Uh... So there's certain applications where lower tier applications, like, I want to say like, uh, maybe like our printing services, things like that, you know, where that we can sustain downtime. We don't really worry about them too much. They, they can kind of get put on the back burner. But what we do is we have dialogues open. So let me back up a little bit and give you a little information on our, our team structure. So we're a bit siloed. So we're a large enterprise. So we have virtualization teams. We have Windows teams, Linux teams. And then each team has their own customers. So Windows Teams customers could be the database admins, it could be application owners, um, you know, same for Linux, like they, they're supporting our SAP environment, so the SAP team could be a customer to them. So we're providing the platform, and as part of the platform, we need to provide, you know, standard recoverability and uh, disaster recovery as well. So I've been having conversations with my Windows Teams and Linux teams to basically say, hey guys, this is a product that we've been using, you know, I'd like to get you on it. And we've done tests, you know, cause one of the great things about Zerto is you can do tests pretty much whenever you want. Um, so we tested out with some dev environments, made sure that the applications can be tested properly. And the more they saw it and the more the app team saw it, word of mouth just started kind of blazing. And once the word of mouth started getting around, I had more and more app owners coming to me requesting Zerto, which was nice. So basically, I don't even have to really sell the product myself anymore. They're selling it for me, so it works out really well. And Joe, in your industry, anything special in the industry, in the IT that we should know in crucial applications and treatment? Sure. Yeah, in our, in our uh, field, it's basically winning business, so they need the right tools and services to win the business, so that, you know, therefore we rolled out things like Office 365 
and we have to make sure critical systems like the commission systems, how the brokers get paid, is up and running, or any of the systems that are, you know, where we generate invoicing and um, you know any kind of services out of our, our ERP systems have to be up and running. So those are our critical systems. And so our, our stories, um, you know, since I started, we went on a journey, that cloud journey everybody talks about. And so we kind of identified what made sense for us. And we talked about cloud first approach, laid all the foundational stuff down. And basically we want to move all our critical apps to a SaaS based solution. Anything that wasn't our core competency, we didn't want to manage. So anything that we did have to retain based on the legacy or historical component, we ended up using Zertal to help us build out some, re some resiliency in that, in that platform, or those platforms. So us, it's all about empowering our colleagues with the right tools and putting things in the right buckets so that we can service them properly and have them available as often as we need to. So you touched on cloud strategy. So how do you define the cloud strategy? What's, what's the guidance that you get from the executive team? And if you can walk us through, and then afterwards, how does, was Zerto part of that uh, strategy and, and why you rightfully sure. chose Zerto? Yeah, it goes back to the availability component. So they wanted things that they wanted um, platforms that were up and running and delivered the collaboration elements as well as um, the availability elements around you know you know commission payments, um, you know the ERP and invoicing type stuff. So they wanted it, things available. So it was it wasn't a hard sell to say these types of critical applications. So think about your core uh, IT systems like you, you know work days of the world, your sales forces of the world. Those things made sense. Why try to reinvent the wheels? So let's get let's retire a lot of these legacy platforms that were homegrown around the world, and that plays into the app hosting component. So I was tasked to close down as many data centers as I could, identify you know what was the target data center to to look for. In our case, it was Equinix um, because of the the cloud integration uh, on the network side, as well as with Azure and AWS and other players. So it's laying the right foundation and then figuring out, okay, for this, the core IT elements, let's put it in a SaaS-based solution. And then for the, the, the stuff that we want to build, our proprietary stuff that's going to give us the edge in the market, so data analytics, things of that nature, is going to help us win the business, then we'll, we'll do it through um, you know, on-prem or in a, in a PaaS or IaaS solution. Nick? So for us, uh, we have two two environments, we have our corporate and we have our broadcast. Um, our corporate environment, it's, it's a very similar story where we're trying to move as much as we can into um, SaaS offerings, so like you know, Office 365, Salesforce, all that. Um, for any of the homegrown apps that we have, it's just the same thing, where we need to be able to protect them and if we can migrate them into the cloud, that's great, um, but we also, there might be some times when we want to bring them back, you know, and a lot of it, we're a global company, and part of being a global company is you know there's different um, data governance you know laws and stuff in place in, in different areas. So, you know I might be able to put something in the cloud in one region, but say we, we buy a company in like Germany or something, and, and they have different laws in there are in the U.S. You know you have to be able to decide if you want to keep your data in the specific uh, cloud provider's data center, or if you want to you know bring it into your own so you can like move it around as you see fit. Um, and then another thing is, like you were saying, as far as um, migrations, when we've purchased companies in the past, they might have different platforms in place. Like we're uh, almost exclusively VMware shop, but we've bought companies that were Hyper-V. So if we need to migrate workloads from, say, legacy uh, Hyper-V onto VMware, it's a great tool to have to uh, accomplish that you know, quickly and easily. I was going to say, in, in our, since I've been with the company, there's been a number of large uh, acquisitions that we made. And so part of the decisioning around cloud was what platforms are going to give us the, the best ability to integrate the companies at a faster pace than we were doing before. So that's, a, that's another big element. And then back to the data center play, really um, with the, the Zerto tool itself, I inherited that tool. I didn't purchase it. But what I saw, we were using it for DR only at the time. But then I saw this huge play on the migration space. And since we've been, we closed down eight data centers and uh, over the last two years and the tool has been invaluable. Um, there's been some challenges that we ran up against in terms of you know, things like the unknowns, like when a network, um, there's unplanned network maintenance at any of the data centers and how does Zerto recover during that event? So we had to live through some of that, but we learned from it and then we were able to improve on it. But again, it's the, the tool from my perspective has done a, you know, a couple of things, help us you know, you know, maintain a good DR posture for our internal apps, but also from a migration standpoint, it's been invaluable. And especially with the multi-site, 
Right now, we're using the multi-site to do, um, we're closing that one data center as an example, and we're, and we're replicating to our, the new prod, and then we're also uh, replicating to the new DR all at the same time, where we couldn't do that you know, eight months ago, 10 months ago. And was this an initiative by the executive team? Was it an initiative that you came up and said, guys, we need to move the cloud? How did this play out? I was voluntold to do it, basically. <laughs> so you are? I was voluntold to do it. <laughs> so I go figure it out? Yeah, basically, hey, hey, we're going to do, oh, we're doing this as a company. Um, you have six months, so go. <laughs> go fetch. Yeah. It's the same? Yeah. So for me, it was twofold. One, there was a financial element where, you know, there's always a driver. How do we reduce costs? And as part of any M&A activity that you've got to find music to my ears, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other one was really, we have an evangelistic CIO, global CIO, that's really big into pushing the envelope with technology and, and how we can enable the business. It's all about enabling the business, not only from, uh, um, you know, delivering fast, but also from uh, an analytics perspective as well. Now, when you started to look at BCDR, I think you touched on it before. What what were you looking at? Why did you choose uh, Zoto? Key elements in consideration. So originally, I, like I said, I was at a hedge fund. And um, I walked into an environment where they had SRM. And at the time, it was, it was working-ish. And um, the recovery times weren't fast enough. So basically, I had conversations with my CFO, um, you know, my, my compliance officer. And they were saying, look, the rate that we're doing trades and the way that we're communicating with our customers, we can't have more than you know, 15 minutes or an hour of an outage. So like, if I were to lose my data, yeah, I can restore it from uh, an hour ago because we were doing you know, backups hourly and things like that. But what about anything that was created during that last hour from when the backup was run previously? So we need to get that, that number down as close as possible. And besides setting up like, you know, real-time database replication and things like that, like doing like availability groups um, or you know, something like that where you're doing application level replication, the, there was no other product in the market that even came close to me. Um, and I POC'd, you know, lots of, I, I tested pretty much everything out there. And uh, to me, Zerto was the best choice just because you know, it was simple, easy to use. I had my POC set up, I think, in about an hour. Um, give or take, you know, and, and that was with data already being fully replicated and, you know, um, at my DR site so I could, you know, start testing failover. Um, you know, so that, that was a clear winner for me. And Joe? So I inherited the product, like I said, and, and you know, Good I, and I was, you know, very skeptical, is this going to do what it needs to do? Um, and then we did, like I said, we did our initial, um, we had a choice to make, so I'll go into a little bit of the detail of, of how to migrate. In the past, when I migrated workloads, I've done it, you know, going back to early 2000, where I basically broke mirrors and moved the yeah. drives over to the other side with similar like hardware. And then I did uh, sand based replication for um, my, my next tour. And so when I got into this, I'm like, well, I was very skeptical. Is this going to work? As, as, and, it, and it worked. Um, and I was very impressed by how quickly. Um, how much it was able to sync the data up, up to what point, and also how easy it is to use um, and, and manage. So, I, I was gonna say one of the other um, issues I was having was my DR site. We had very old legacy uh, storage, so I had a co-rate solution, and basically they went out of business one day. I called up for Swart, and they were they were just gone. So I was like, okay, then what do I do now? Um, and the fact that Zerto was basically storage agnostic, it was hypervisor agnostic, I could work on different versions simultaneously where you didn't have to worry about, you know, being on specific versions of code, uh, you know, from the hypervisor level or the storage level was huge to me. So I could basically have, you know, one system in my production site that was running all flash and then I could have taken the legacy storage that I just replaced, put that in my DR site just, you know, in case of glass break or case of emergency break glass and um, I'm ready to go. So that was another huge selling point for me was that the, just being agnostic. What about the cloud strategy? How did Zerto play into your cloud strategies of migration? What, you know, when you, look, when you build a cloud strategy, when you were encouraged within six months by your executive team come to a cloud strategy, how did Zerto play into it? Well, Private, public, all those, sorry. So uh, you were mentioning as far as migrations also, we're in the middle of a giant data center migration. We're basically closing an entire site and looking to uh, move everything from New Jersey out to uh, Long Island uh, in New York. And what I'm going through now is we have our mission critical apps that we can suffer no downtime, you know, basically whatsoever. So 
one of the things I liked, uh, that I really like about um, the fact that you know, Azure uh, support is just announced for you know, failout, I could temporarily move my mission critical workloads up into Azure, let everything run there, or you know, even if I did it to a cloud service provider, you know, for that swing space, you know, instead of having to set up a new data center myself, test everything, make sure I have all my links up, you know, do all my migrations, I can move everything to a, a swing space temporarily that's in the cloud, go through the rest of this whole migration, get everything tested and validated, and then move those workloads back down. So just having the option to do that easily is tremendous. Was that an important element in your decision? It definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at a couple of different things we want to do with Zerto. So one, we want to replace our DR infrastructure instead of having cold sites or you know, sites that are kind of a mixture between cold and warm or hot. We want to basically get rid of that and, and do away with it and put it in Azure. So we want to migrate our DR workloads completed, completely to Azure. We just finished a POC on migrating some workloads over. We're going to be doing some application testing on it soon. And if it plays out, we'll probably start off with our tier two, tier three applications. Tier one, this, the appetite still isn't there to put it in the cloud. So we're kind of fighting those, you know, either contractual obligations or just people just aren't, are nervous about it. But that's ultimately where we're going is to, you know, ultimately get all the workloads in the cloud, right? So whether it's SaaS, IaaS, or PaaS, but these are, these are phases that we have to naturally go through. So we went from 18 data centers um, down to 10. And now and well, from 10, we want to get it down even further to five or four, so globally. Private, hybrid, public, what do you prefer and why? Private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, what is your structure? I, um, I prefer hybrid personally. Yeah, hybrid is the way to go. That's why you pick, we picked Equinix as that provider because they, they play well in that space as well as uh, Microsoft as a partner for Azure. But one thing that's important is that a part of our strategy, we didn't want to get tied down to one cloud provider. Um, so we make sure that you know, whatever location we pick can talk to the two. The other play for, for Zerto um, you know, that I see down the road is the, um, the, you know, the, the, the multi-site replication. I do want to continue to take advantage of that. Um, and then in addition to that, from an Azure, going back to the Azure play, we are looking at Commvault, um, putting Commvault as the, the backup standard and then migrating a lot of our backup workloads into Azure. Um, so, and I haven't looked at the Zerto um, solution yet in that space, but it's something we'll probably look at. Another topic that's uh, really hot today is ransomware. Are you concerned? Yep. You sleep so good, do you sleep good at night? I, I, I am actually a former victim. I got hit with CryptoLocker, I don't know, like two and a half years ago, something like that. And I was one of the first people that actually did the journal restore. So that was actually, you know, <laughs> lifesaver for me. You know, once I saw um, time stands on when I got hit, I basically went back to the first checkpoint before that and was able to restore everything. So it, it was, it was huge. You know, we, like I said, we've been using the product for so long that just having the ability to do that and, you know, I, I do believe in having multiple um, data protection strategies. So you have to have good backups, you know, and take them as often as you can, um, you know, providing you have the, uh, the ability and the, the, the money to do it. Um, but having multiple ways to restore. And in some instances, you know, just doing a full VM restore is the best case. In other instances, you want to just restore a couple files. And in you know, my case, I had basically had to do something like where I picked Zerto because it gave me the most up-to-date um, copy of my files. So, yeah. Same thing. Um, we, do want, we do have multiple uh, protection strategies. But to your point, I haven't explored what Zerto can do in that space. But obviously, since we have the product in our critical apps, we could take advantage of it if, if that were to happen. How was life before Zerto? You never had one, I guess. <laughs> um, but how was life before Zerto? Reporting, working, workloads, time, meaning so, experience before and experience after. So I remember the days of array replication, you know, DR consisted of shipping a tape over to your DR site, restoring the tape. Once the tape is restored, now you have to go and restore the databases, go through the application testing. So you, your basic RTO is somewhere in the one to two day um, you know, window. Now I'm looking at something where I have everything automated. I've, you know, I have PowerShell scripts to do my, uh, my failover tests or my, my failover restores and everything. Um, all my DNS updates are automatic, so I literally click a button and I have to wait like 12 minutes only because I have startup timers, you know, to let my database come up and be validated. And then after that, my app servers, then my web server. So, you know, you go from two days to 20 minutes at, at the most. And, you know, how can you, 
top that. I agree. It's true. And in the past, you have to you used to have to worry about that was like one of the biggest elements. But now the biggest element is the process around the business and getting them engaged because we lay it down as a foundation so we know it works. So now it's just a matter of you know when we fail over, here's how the business plugs in and are you ready to test and are you ready to. So we've done, since I've been here, uh, several successful tests on critical apps, and it's just worked flawlessly, so. I've even had, you know, at the hedge fund, I had my, my chief compliance officer would come up to me in the morning and say, hey, guys, we're going to do a failover today. So don't tell anyone. Just fail it over to the DR site, and I'm going to start asking questions. And they would basically send out a questionnaire at the end of the day. Did you have any problems? What were the issues? You know, and, you know, I basically would say, please send me an email so I have confirmation that you asked me to do this so that I'm not going to you know, have, so have a job fire. next week. Exactly. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, CYA. Um, but basically, they, you know, we would do these tests, and it was actually eye-opening because a lot of the DR strategy isn't just getting the VMs from one place to the other. You know, it's making sure that if you have external access. So for us, we had other markets that we had to talk to. So we had to make sure that all of our applications were accessible you know, through our WAN connections at the DR site as well, that we had the right firewall rules in place, that you know, a lot of the things that we had spent time working on in production were actually mirrored over to the uh, disaster recovery site. And you know, from what I've seen is a lot of times people forget that those little things, well, not really little things, but like forgetting a firewall rule can basically cost you from having your app be up or down. So all that has to be kind of taken into account as you're planning your DR strategy. And the other thing is, most people when they do DR, they also plan like a run book or something like that. I think the fact that you can pretty much base most of your run book right off your, your VPG configuration. So I would literally just start doing print screens of my VPG or do you know, exports of the configuration. And now I have, you know, the majority of my run book is done. And when it comes time to do the actual test, you're just either kicking off a script or you're going through like five or six mouse clicks and you're done. Um, and then at that point, it's hey, app owners, make sure everything's up and running, and you know, there could be a process after the VMs are there, but you know, that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, from your side, yeah. So um, you know, from a, a DR perspective, you know, I really want to see the, the evolution of our environment going into um, you, with the Zerto play, um, because I think it'll take that what he's suggesting to the next level. I think you know. Um, meaning, you know, because the replication is in place, you know, in the cloud, from a, a network perspective, we start to get rid of the, the that it hopefully make it so that it's almost agnostic in terms of, you know, being able to, people to be able to talk to it and access the application. So I'm really looking forward to that next play. Any other future plans for Zerto? Is he using the Zerto software in the, in the organization? Or? I mean, I'm just going to keep using it because I, I, I love stuff that just works and anything that takes time away from my day where I can go back to watching YouTube, I'm very happy with. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, new features I'd like to see um, that I, I've been pretty much telling everybody about, about out there. But, uh, you know, I, the way that the roadmap appears and, you know, just seeing the new features that were announced today, you know, you guys are definitely going in the right direction. So I uh, hope you keep on doing it. Any advice for someone who's looking to use that, or What would you tell them? Talk to us. <laughs> talk Basically, talk, yeah. grab this is, and you know, honestly, everybody's here. So if there's anyone you have to talk to, if you have any question whatsoever, there's somebody in this building right now that can answer your question. Um, talk to customers. If you're not doing a POC, do one. Um, and really, just just ask people that have used the product. You know, every time I'm looking at a new application or a new um, you know hardware, I always do customer reference calls and you know try to talk to people that are. You know, heavily. Involved. I'm also uh, a VMUG leader, and you know, I have like access to the VExpert community. So, you know, I'm always asking real-world opinions and trying to see if there's somebody who has the same use case as me and what they've done in the past. Because, you know, somebody's probably done it already, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to ask them how they did it and see if it applies to your situation as well. So this is the first time I've ever done this for any partner that I've ever worked with. So I'll just just as an example of how you know how much I believe in the product. So just uh, one thing I would say that I would ask you guys to take advantage of is when we had challenges with the product, because um, you do with every product, is to have that kind of relationship with the account manager. Say, hey, this isn't working. I need your best people on it. How can you get it working quickly? 
and they've been very accommodating, um, even to the point where from a roadmap perspective, there are things that I want to still see out of the product. So that, that example where we ran into that unplanned network maintenance, we had to rebuild BPGs and we were worried about missing our maintenance window. So there's, we would like to see in the future things like you know, better recovery you know, features and, and things of that nature. But the good news is they're a great partner and they're willing to work with you on that kind of roadmap um, stuff. And so I would definitely advise taking advantage of that. This is great. Any questions? You have the panel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Nick, you mentioned you use PowerShell scripting for automation. Do you use any other orchestration or automation software? I dabble with VRA, um, VRA, VRO. I'm looking. So, one of the things that I really want to get more into is, is the uh, REST API and basically being able to, as I create new um, new VMs. You know, whenever, however I tag them or if I put them in like a specific folder or something like that, I want them to get automatically protected um, based on either a tag or, you know, where they are. Um, so that, that's kind of next on my, uh, my to-do list is the, the VRA integration. And we're also, as a company, we use ServiceNow. So there's a lot of integration that can be done with ServiceNow. You know, similar, as long as you can access the API, um, you should be able to accomplish any of those, those kind of tasks. But. Yeah. It's live, being able to launch the apps and things like that. So that, we're, like I said, we're very siloed. So it would be a lot of different teams involved in getting that done. So I'm trying to basically get it so where the VMs are up, all DNS changes are done. Like, I want to give it to them as close to being done as possible so that their part of the integration and testing is, is minimal. Because I'm not going to say that. The other teams are a little bit <laughs> behind, but they're not the, the, the VMware team. Let's just, you know. <laughs> guys, anything else? Oh, come on. Yeah. There you go. So you said you worked in a hedge fund speech before. You did like a failover of mid, I guess, before market open. Yeah. Uh, how did you deal with like extra vendors, like their tests that they have to do POT before they even yeah, so, so basically you're talking like, like the Ezes and the uh, Charles yeah, River and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what we had to do was basically, you know, you have your, your set of IP blocks that, that they see as like, you know, allowed. We basically had to do a failover test with them on the phone, make sure that they could see the IPs come up on their side. They had to whitelist all those IPs. <laughs> so like literally as you were standing up like your, your production site, we had to go through the exact same thing on the DR side with them, um, have them validate it, have them look at the servers once they were failed over. And what I usually would do is when we were doing a failover test, I would open up a, a ticket just in case um, and basically have them on the phone and ready to go just in case we ran into a problem or if we didn't see anything. So like when he would come in and say, uh, all right, I need you to test this, like literally before the door closed, I was already on the phone with them. But, like, answer your question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Guys, anything else? I have a good question for you. So, like, if um, you guys are hybrid, or you're, you answered the question already of uh, cloud or hybrid, or, or on premise, you said hybrid. Right? Mm -hmm. so, Correct. You know, from a, you know, if you had a blank slate, if you knew the applications uh, that you were supporting today would remain exactly the same. And you, it was your budget. So if I had my choice, yeah. everything would be in the cloud, right? So the only thing that's restricting me is, like I said, the contractual obligations or people just don't feel comfortable doing it with tier one apps that are homegrown. Um, but they've already, so when I started, there was a bunch of work order management systems we did from the facility side where they were, that we had, uh, we ran Maximo inside, um, you know, for the work order management systems. And we weren't geared up for that. We, we couldn't support those systems. I had a very lean staff. So I partnered with uh, the owner of that group and said, hey, listen, you're going to get better service. You're going to get faster upgrades. You're going to get the extensibility of being able to expand this as you bring on more customers. So it makes sense to do this. So it was really a convincing them to do the right thing. 
So the play there was to get it out of the data center. So if I have my way, I want to get everything out of the on-prem data center. If anything, what I want to do, if I have to, is just at a minimum, just if I need a secondary egress because it has to be private, I'm willing to do that until we can figure out how to do, just go straight to the cloud and keep it private. But so that, that would be my personal play is just get everything out. But it's going to take time. It's going to take three years before people are really convinced that it's viable. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Is so you have to shift that mindset of just because somebody owned it and built it and it's proprietary, because we got burned by a few of those where no more person, IPs. Yeah, you don't know, hard code IPs in it and everything, because we got burned by that too. Yeah. But but so we had to get those people that were holding on to those things, either convince them or you know they have to work their way out because we can't sustain that over time. So. So I would probably go into the cloud. My only reservation with it right now is I want to get to a place where my hybrid cloud is multiple public clouds. So I have, instead of having my on-prem and I have Azure or AWS, I want to be able to move things easily from Azure directly to AWS. So right now it's more of a, well, the plan is going to be, it's going to be like a, a layover where I can go from Azure to VMware, VMware to AWS, things like that. But it's not a true solution. I want it to be where I have the protection you know, from AZ to AZ, but I also have it from cloud vendor to cloud vendor. Um, we're not anywhere close to it yet, but that, that's kind of like our moving target is what we're trying to hit. So guys, thank you very much. Yeah. It's a pleasure thank having you. you. Thanks.